हेलो एंड वेलकम टू नारायणा आई एस माई नेम इज अभिजीत श्रीवास्तव वी आर हेयर टू डिस्कस डेली न्यूज एनालिसिस टूडे इज फोर्थ मार्च ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी फोर एंड लेट्स है क्विक रिव्यू ऑन द टॉपिक्स दैट वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस हेयर फर्स्ट इज फ्रॉम पेज नंबर सिक्स ऑफ द हिंदू डेली एडिशन विच टॉक्स अबाउट द प्लास्टिक पॉल्यूशन विच आर चोकिंग द हिमालयन स्टेट वॉट इज प्लास्टिक पॉल्यूशन एंड वाई दिस प्लास्टिक पॉल्यूशन इज बिकमिंग अ प्रॉब्लम फॉर आर हिमालयन स्टेट एंड वॉट कुड बी द वे फॉरवर्ड वी विल बी डिस्कसिंग हेयर Second article is from page number seven, a Women's Urban Employment Guarantee Act. The author has given a model to improve the economic participation of women in India, especially in urban India, through which we can improve the economic development and to ensure lesser gender inequality in our society. third article is from page number 6 the long road to reforming india's political party system and this article is discussing about the 10th schedule and its anomalies how it is in the trade off relationship with inner party democracy and what could be the way forward we will be discussing Next article is National Dam Panel to Examine Kaleshwaram Project on March 6. This is prelims related article and all the related information all the important information related with the Kaleshwaram project will be discussed. Next article is where clean air funds allotted to state went drain fountains road. this article is raising a concern over the misutilization of the funds given to improve air quality in indian cities we will be discussing last article is grey zone warfare so this is a term which is important for international affair and internal security what is the meaning of grey zone warfare and how it is affecting india we will be discussing and after all these articles we will be discussing the preliminary and mains related questions so let's start this discussion embark on your upsc journey with narayana ias academy our esteemed 5 year and 3 year integrated programs now open for admissions in hyderabad vijayawada and nellore our courses includes robust r&d backed initiatives such as first daily news analysis and daily news read comprehensive review program for a broader understanding of current affairs second ncert program a foundational course that covers all ncert syllabi crucial for upsc preparation third mentorship program for personalized guidance and regular test series for systematic learning and assessment so begin your journey to becoming a leader with narayana ias academy today so the first article for today's discussion is mountains of plastic are choking the himalayan states thanks to certain anthropogenic activities we have increased the vulnerability of our himalayan region by infusing plastic pollution in this region what is himalayan region himalayan region are the mountainous area of the india it encompasses entire human himalayan range within the country and it stretches from the north western part of jammu and kashmir to east or north eastern part of arunachal pradesh right it covers 11 states and two union territories which are those states and union territories union territory of L jammu and kashmir union territory of ladakh himachal pradesh uttarakhand sikkim seven sisters of north eastern india 
असम अरुणाचल प्रदेश नागालैंड मणिपुर मिजोरम त्रिपुरा एंड मेघालय एंड वन मोर स्टेट इज वेस्ट बंगाल दिस हिमालयन रीजन हैज इट्स ओन सिग्निफिकेंस सच एज इन्वायरमेंटल इकोलॉजिकल एंड इकोनॉमिक वी कैन ऑल्सो कॉल इट एज सोशियो इकोनॉमिक राइट वाई इन्वायरमेंटल सो इट इज प्रिवेंटिंग साइबेरियन कोल्ड वेव्स टू एंटर इन टू इंडियन सब कॉन्टिनेंट एंड दैट इज वाई इट इज मॉडरेटिंग इंडियाज क्लाइमेटिक कंडीशन राइट इट सपोर्ट्स वेरियस फ्लोरा एंड फाउना एंड दैट इज वाई दिस ईस्टर्न हिमालय इज ऑल्सो अ हॉट स्पॉट रीजन राइट इट ऑल्सो सपोर्ट्स वेरियस इको सिस्टम्स एज फार एज इकोनमी इज कंसर्न इट इज अ वेरी गुड प्लेस फॉर टूरिज्म एंड इट सपोर्ट्स वेरियस एग्रीकल्चरल एंड इंडस्ट्रियल एक्टिविटीज इंक्लूडिंग हॉर्टिकल्चर राइट बट बिकॉज ऑफ इट्स ओरिजिन बिकॉज ऑफ इट्स ओरिजिन इट्स वेरी फ्रेजाइल एरिया वाई बिकॉज इट इज इन बिटवीन टू प्लेट्स वन इज यूरेशियन एंड अनदर इज इंडो ऑस्ट्रेलियन राइट एंड बिकॉज ऑफ दिस फ्रेजाइल नेचर इट इज वेरी वलरेबल इट्स वलरेबल फॉर अर्थ क्विक्स लैंड स्लाइड्स एंड क्लाउड बर्स्ट राइट वाई दिस आर्टिकल इज इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर अस बिकॉज वी हैव इंक्रीज वन मोर वलरेबिलिटी फॉर दिस रीजन दैट इज प्लास्टिक पोल्यूशन एंड इन यू पी एस सी सिलेबस यूल फाइंड देर इज अ टॉपिक इन जी एस पेपर वन जोग्राफिकल फीचर्स एंड देयर लोकेशन इन क्रिटिकल जोग्राफिकल फीचर्स इंक्लूडिंग वाटर बॉडीज आइस कैप्स एंड इन फ्लोरा फाउना एंड द इफेक्ट ऑफ सब चेंजेस सो वी आर डिस्कसिंग द हिमालयन स्टेट्स हेयर जी एस पेपर थ्री कंजर्वेशन इन्वायरमेंटल पोल्यूशन एंड डिग्रेडेशन सो दैट इज वाई दिस आर्टिकल बिकम्स इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर अस लेट्स अंडरस्टैंड द इम्पॉर्टेंस ऑफ दिस टॉपिक एंड दिस आर्टिकल विद द हेल्प ऑफ प्रीवियस ईयर क्वेश्चन ट्वेंटी नाइनटीन यू पी एस सी आस दिस क्वेश्चन दैट हाउ कैन द माउंटेन इको सिस्टम बी री स्टोर फ्रॉम द नेगेटिव इम्पैक्ट ऑफ डेवलपमेंटल इनिशियटिव एंड टूरिज्म सो देर आर टू एंथ्रोपोजेनिक फैक्टर्स विच आर causing harmful impacts on the mountain ecosystem one is developmental initiative and tourism so these two initiatives these two factors are also causing plastic pollution and that you can expect in future upsc can ask this question what is the context plastic pollution it is affecting or harming himalayan states and this impact is very severe with various factors contributing to the crisis and several implication for not just environment but also for local communities we know that plastic pollution is ubiquitous it can be found in human lungs it can be found in placentas it can be found in ocean it can be found in mountainous regions right mostly this microplastic what is microplastic the part of tiny part of plastic which has diameter lesser than 5 mm right and it can be found or it is being found in everywhere everywhere in this biosphere right but this microplastic or this plastic pollution is impacting our ecology environment ecology and biodiversity how this article is discussing only these two things but uh, this can be extended to soil and air pollution as well it is affecting our water resources microplastics are found in the water resources the biodiversity or the fauna or the flora is getting affected by this plastic presence their bio accumulation is happening bio accumulation means getting this plastic particles are getting stored in a particular trophic level and when this plastic pollution which is stored in a particular trophic level is moved to another trophic level its intensity and share or you can say percentage is getting increased in 
upper trophic level that is known as biomagnification. This article is given in, giving an example that in Assam, there is a Ramsar site, the poor bill, and there is a bird named as greater adjutant star. They have been feasting on plastic waste instead of fishes from the wetland. And this is a very severe challenge for us if we want to secure our environment, ecology, and biodiversity, right? There are several waste audit conducted by various organizations, various movements. One of the important movement among them is the Himalayan cleanup. This social movement is conducted by or started by Integrated Mountain Initiative and Zero Waste Himalayas, right? There's another waste audit conducted by National Productivity Council of India and third waste audit conducted by Brand Audit. All of them shows that there is an increase in the pollution or plastic pollution in the Himalayan region, right? The Himalayan Cleanup 2022 waste audit, it shows that the 92% of the or 93% of the waste that we throw to Himalayan region are plastic, right? And out of which 72% are non-cyclic in nature. And this shows severity of the plastic pollution in the Himalayan region. What are the basic reasons? First reason is rapid urbanization. To show this rapid urbanization, there is an example. The report conducted by or report published by Social Development for Communities Foundation. This foundation is situated in Dehradun. It highlights the plight of towns in Uttarakhand drowning in plastic waste, right? So this shows that rapid urbanization is creating or is a very one of the biggest contributor of plastic pollution in the Himalayan region. Second is changing production and consumption pattern. How? For example, milk distribution. Earlier, this milk was distributed with the help of some metallic pots, right? Now, milk is being distributed with the help of plastic packets, right? Third major important contributor to plastic pollution is tourism. To substantiate this argument, this article has given one example that recently NGT, National Green Tribunal, issued notices to various organizations among which Ministry of Environment, Ecology, Environment, Forest and Climate Change, CPCB, Himachal Pradesh State Pollution Control Board, Deputy Commissioner Lahol Spiti and Panchayat of Kosar in Himachal Pradesh, which shows that this tourism is contributing or it's affecting our Himalayan region by infusing a lot of plastic in this region, in this fragile region, right? Also, one, one of the biggest contributor to this plastic pollution is unscientific plastic disposal. How? So, our management or government has certain capabilities to restore our environment ecology, to recycle the plastic pollution of plastics which are thrown in the environment and to stop the plastic pollution. But there is a mismatch in the plastic waste that is being thrown in the environment and the management capacities. And this is the contributor in the unscientific plastic disposal. How? We can take help of Plastic Overshoot Day, which are published by or which are initiated by Environment Action. The Environment Action is an organization, Swiss-based organization. It introduced the concept of Plastic Overshoot Day. What is Overshoot Day in general? So, this is a part of biosphere. A population, it can, this biosphere or part of biosphere can sustain a section of population. How? This biosphere is giving resources or generating resources and it is also absorbing the wastage. So, this biosphere has capacity to produce resources and to absorb the wastage created by this population. If this waste generation surpasses the resource creation, it is called as overshoot. 
right and a date in particular year in which it this absorption or this waste creation surpasses the resource creation is called as overshoot day so this is the day each year when the amount of plastic waste generated surpasses what the waste management system can handle is called as plastic overshoot day right and it has been found it has been observed that in 2023 india reached its plastic overshoot day on january 6 and which is very alarming situation right also whatever we have claimed we are not producing the same results how despite the cpcb the central pollution control board it claims systematic capacity to manage plastic waste india faces significant challenges with one of the highest mismanaged waste indices so this is a index global index mismanaged waste indices and india is one of the top most mismanaged country in the world right global ranking as far as global ranking is concerned india's mwi is one of the highest only surpassed by countries like kenya nigeria and mozambique right so india is highly mismanaged in terms of plastic pollution right so that is why we can claim that in india we see unscientific disposal of waste another example government claims versus reality indian government claims that 60% there is a 60% recycling rate of plastic waste but in reality as per center for science and environment shows that only 12% of plastic is recycled through mechanical processes right there is also concept of end of life solution when we burn the plastic or if we use this plastic as road creation or for the road creation this becomes end of life solution we are ending the life of plastic right but approximately 20% of india's plastic waste is used in the end of life solution such as co incineration plastic to fuel and road making however these methods cannot be accepted as recycling methods right these methods cannot be considered as recycling method right there is also unaccounted plastic waste a significant portion 68% of plastic waste remains unaccounted for it indicates that a substantial discrepancy in the waste management and recycling figures right there are certain legal mandates for waste management first regulatory framework solid waste management rules 2016 plastic waste management rules 2016 and extended producer responsibility rules 2022 these management rules these methods can be asked in upsc prelims so we have to read these framework regulatory framework in detail right second is hill area consideration while the swm swachh bharat mission recognizes the special need of hill areas these specific needs are not adequately addressed in the mandates for local bodies and producer importers and brand owners known as pibos under pwm and epr what are pwm plastic waste management rules and epr extended producer responsibility 2022 right there are certain states who has initiated certain initiatives or processes to curb the plastic pollution in the himalayan region but these initiatives are not sufficient enough for example himachal pradesh and sikkim have laws banning certain plastic items have have implemented policies like buy back scheme to reduce plastic pollution there are certain case studies that you can utilize in your mains examination as a fodder material himachal pradesh and sikkim have special state laws banning the use of plastic 
हिमाचल प्रदेश हैज बाई बैक पॉलिसी फॉर नॉन रिसाइकलेबल एंड सिंगल यूज प्लास्टिक सिंस ट्वेंटी नाइनटीन बट देर इज स्टिल वाइड स्प्रेड लिटरिंग ऑफ प्लास्टिक वेस्ट सिक्किम बैंड पैकेज मिनरल वाटर यूज फ्रॉम जनवरी ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी टू एंड हैज अ फेयरली रोबस्ट रेगुलेटरी सिस्टम बट इन द एबसेंस ऑफ प्रॉपर इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर टू हैंडल प्लास्टिक वेस्ट द स्टेट इज स्टिल ग्रैपलिंग विद द इशू मिजोरम हैज बीन प्रोएक्टिव ऑन द रेगुलेटरी फ्रेमवर्क द आइजोल म्यूनिसपल कॉरपोरेशन मेड बाई लॉस अंडर द पी डब्ल्यू एम प्लास्टिक वेस्ट मैनेजमेंट इन त्रिपुरा हैज मेड पॉलिसी चेंजेस इनएक्टेड म्यूनिसिपल बाई लॉज एंड हैज अ स्टेट लेवल टास्क फोर्स टू एलिमिनेट सिंगल यूज प्लास्टिक थ्रू द रिजल्ट आर दो द रिजल्ट आर नॉट पॉसिबल सो वॉट आर द चैलेंजेस इन द इम्प्लीमेंटेशन बिकॉज वी हैव सीन अ लॉट ऑफ इनिशिएटिव हैज बीन टेकन बाई सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट एंड स्टेट गवर्नमेंट राइट एंड सर्टन सिविल सोसाइटी ऑर्गेनाइजेशन बट डिस्पाइट दीज एफर्ट्स issues such as insufficient infrastructure for waste management and continued littering persist in these states how first what are the basic challenges first is waste segregation the rules require waste segregation at the source right but there is a gap between the rules and the implementation these wastes are not segregated these wastes are not segregated as per the rules second is impact of mixed waste if we are not segregating the plastic or the waste at the source these wastes are creating or impacting in further recycling of the waste so this mixed waste in the landfills leads to soil and ground water pollution and emits harmful fumes undermining environmental and public health Ro local bodies can play a significant role in this issue but they are not performing their role because of various reasons we will be looking in a couple of minutes right there is also policy and power devolution there is a role of panchayati raj there is a role of municipal corporation and they are not able to perform their roles because of this policy and power devolution or lack of power devolution also we are not including the traditional institutions such as tribal communities in this waste segregation and the waste management right and this is also a challenge in the implementation of various policies and schemes because these policies these schemes are not even recognizing the traditional institutions for this waste or plastic pollution there is also challenge in the financial support financial allocations from initiatives such as swachh bharat mission and the 15 finance commission are directed towards improving waste management including in traditional institution in himalayan region but these financial support are not transmitted to the local bodies or the traditional institutions so how we can address the issue to address this issue we need to understand two things one is from human point of view and another is from technology point of view from human point of view we can use stakeholder based approach how so who are the stakeholders major stakeholders first is central and state governments and their initiatives second is pibos third is local government and lastly public right so we have to empower local government we have to increase traditional communities we have to incorporate traditional communities in the definition of local government we have to sensitize people regarding tourism regarding plastic pollution we have to ensure responsibilities by the pibos and we have to improve the policies as well as schemes and initiatives conducted or started by central and state governments as far as technology is concerned data is the new king we have to come up with precise data through which we can understand the exact problem and we can work upon that also we have to bring state of art technology 
to reduce to prevent and to pro to prevent the plastic pollution and to protect our environment and ecology right how so we need to allocate the resources we need to empower local bodies these two are for local bodies or local governments we need to develop infrastructure technology we need to segregate the waste at the source and the public participation we need to ensure this is for public as a stakeholder epr consideration we need to adjust the e extended producer responsibility to ensure responsibilities of pibos we need to collect precise data this is from technology point of view we need to converge the scheme swachh swachh bharat mission manrega and finance commission grant so we need to converge the scheme there is also one argument or suggestion given by the article is that this swachh bharat post trust we have to utilize this trust to channel philanthropic and corporate social responsibility funds towards the waste management initiatives also central government has started various schemes we can converse this scheme we can utilize this scheme to improve or to reduce the plastic pollution from the himalayan region for example integrate waste waste management efforts with the atal mission for rejuvenation and urban transformation and the smart cities scheme to enhance waste management and aim for plastic free cities in the region next article is a women's urban employment guarantee act christian lagard she is a president of european central bank and when she was managing director of imf she argued that if we increase the women's participation in labor force in india at par with men it will increase india's gdp by 27% which shows that women's empowerment is very much necessary it is imperative for economic development of india right also we we know that economy is the reflection of society and society is the reflection of economy for example if society is patriarchal women in economy will have a very poor position there will be glass ceiling effect women will be concentrated to less productive sectors right and if we improve the economy or the women's position in economy it will also be reflected in the social structure it will be helpful in reducing gender inequality in the society as well right this article is arguing both of this how women's economic empowerment will be reflected in economic development of the country as well as social empowerment of the women for which they have given a model they have proposed a model that is urban employment guarantee act which is based upon the duet model given by john dreis john dreis is the brain behind mg narega scheme and similar to this mg narega scheme he proposed this duet scheme for urban employment decentralized urban employment and training scheme right why this article is important why this issue is important because gs paper 1 there is a topic role of women gs paper 3 there is a topic indian economy and issues relating to planning mobilization of resources growth development and employment right so this article is discussing about urban employment and women employment that is why this article becomes important so let's understand the importance with the help of previous year question 2016 upsc asked this question 
women empowerment in india needs gender budgeting what is gender budgeting if we give gender but gender perspective to the budgeting if we give women's perspective to the budgeting it becomes gender budgeting right at that time upsc was interested in this gender budgeting and how this gender budgeting is associated with women women empowerment now in upcoming future you can expect that upsc can ask urban employment opportunity for the women how this is related to women empowerment why because nowadays a very peculiar fact is being discussed a lot many times like women's urban employment rate is way lesser than the women's rural employment rate right so you can expect this type of question in upcoming upsc mains or prelims examination what is the context reducing gender gaps and increasing women's empowerment these are the part of sustainable development goals and apart from ethical and constitutional imperatives these reducing gender gaps and increasing women empowerment will be helpful in economic empowerment economic development of the society and the india as well as it will also reduce the gender inequality in the society right what is gender empowerment we have to understand this thing first this gender this women empowerment includes three basic elements one is increasing capacity what is increasing capacity if we skill people if we increase the skill in the people if we increase the or if we give the information to the people if we improve the skill in the people for example in traditional society if you know the martial art you are capable for which let's understand women empowerment gender gap and economic growth what is gender empowerment gender empowerment includes three basic elements first is increasing capacity how we can increase the capacity if we give a skill to the people if we give information to the people which is valuable in the society it will increase the capacity of that person for example in traditional society if you know the martial art you are capable similarly in current society if you know artificial intelligence if you know how to uh, code right so you can increase your capacity right knowledge is the power in this society in this current setup right so this is first element of women empowerment second is control life if you have control over your life how we can judge control life decision making processes throughout our life we take certain decisions or we are related with certain decisions for example when to marry when to procreate so if you have control over these decision making processes or these decisions you will have control over your life right and this is the second element of women's empowerment third is realizing full potential if you are giving proper environment freedom liberty to the women so that they can achieve what they deserve they will realize their full potential and this is the third part third element of the women empowerment right and there is a gender gap right if we address this gender gap if we address gender employment gap which are aligned with the sustainable development goals we can not only boost economic growth but also will be helpful in the reducing gender inequality in the society right what are the factors which are creating this gender gap in economic infrastructure in especially in the urban area first is social norms second is lack of safety and third is hostile transportation there are other factors as well but this article is discussing all these three major factors which are hurting women's position women's participation in urban economy or urban economic infrastructure certain states have taken various initiative to improve women's position in economy but still it shows high female participation rates right some states have urban employment programs which are not exclusively for women but still there is a gap in terms of women's empowerment right this article is arguing two things 
giving arguments or giving two arguments which shows that there is still gap and which shows high unmet demand for urban employment as far as women empowerment women employment is concerned this ar article is arguing that as per plfs survey what is plfs service periodic labor force survey it shows that the unemployment rate in urban india as far as women unemployment is concerned there is a 9% urban unemployment as compared to rural areas it's 4% which shows that our urban economic infrastructure is not creating adequate employment opportunity especially for women right so urban employment is the first factor through which we can understand there is a high unmet demand for employment and second thing they are arguing this article is arguing that almost 25% of urban women have completed their higher secondary education compared to rural women which is 5% right and which shows that there is a under utilization or cross under utilization of their potential that that is why they are arguing we need to create a model we need to create a sustainable model through which we can provide women employment opportunities right so they have given this wuega proposal right this wuega proposal or which is known as women's urban employment guarantee act will address various aspects of women's employment in urban areas and which will be aiming to enhance economic participation and their social empowerment right in this proposal which is derived or which is derived from duet scheme of john dries it has three basic elements one is skill and apprentice ship program right second is job opportunity creation of job opportunity and third is social audit the social audit is you can observe this social audit even in manrega scheme this job opportunities will be suitable for the local needs and through which we can make this whole job opportunities or this whole program a sustainable model so what is the proposal they proposed a act so that we can back this scheme with some legislative provision would ensure at least 50% of the program management staff are women and include worksite facilities such as child care example crèche crèche system right and this proposal is giving opportunity for local empowerment so that it can obliterate the problem of hostile transportation system right what could be the work types urban work activities could include environmental project and should be tailored to local needs that we have seen right there should be incentives and welfare could include welfare board inclusion offering maternity benefits pension and emergency funds right we have to provide skill and skill and apprenticeship program education to the women so that they can fit for this these job opportunities for which they have proposed information facilitation center and apprenticeship programs or apprenticeship sub programs right these centers this information facilitation center these centers will be run by women with at least a higher education or high education high school education would offer computer training and other services through which you can empower or you can inculcate skill in the women through apprenticeship program this embedded apprenticeship program in the employment program can help make women more job ready and support community empowerment right we have also seen that there is a third provision social audit these social audit unit with significant female staff would monitor the program offering employment and skill building opportunities right this article is also giving one substantiation for their proposal and they said that the such type of schemes is already initiated has already initiated by certain government for example 
they said women manage waste management in karnataka it demonstrate the potential impact of such type of initiative or such initiative you can also take example of kudumb shri initiative of kerala right kudumb shri is a local women's shg groups and which are giving employment opportunity to women for their empowerment right as far as scale and funding is concerned initial participation might be 50% of the eligible women with significant funding requirement from the government representing about 2% of the gdp they are also saying uh, we have to implement this whole initiative in a phased manner so that we can evaluate over the time and we can adjust the whole initiative or the scope of the whole initiative or address the challenges during the implementation of this scheme what would be the broader implication of this scheme success could pave the way for a more inclusive women employment program shifting from income insurance to income assurance this key phrase or key word can be helpful for your mains examination particularly for women next article is the long road to reforming india's political party system weber you can consider weber as father of bureaucracy he argued that the ultimate aim of political parties is to capture power in a democratic system how you capture power when you have the number so within a legislature or within parliament if you have majority you will capture the power right what was happening during 1980s there was a syndrome witnessed in the indian political system known as ayaram gayaram syndrome under which legislators or leaders in the name of dissent they usually defect the political parties what is political defection we will be looking in a couple of minute but usually what was happening they in the name of dissent they defect from their original political party and they switch from one party to another party very frequently this was created or this whole ayaram gayaram friend syndrome it created instability in india's political system instability it also encourage unethical political actions and which eventually created a lot of scope for political corruption right to prevent this corruption to prevent this unethical behavior and to improve stability in political structure we brought 52nd constitutional amendment act 1985 through which we inserted 10th schedule <laughs> which incorporated anti defection law in india right this article is arguing that still there are problem in the 10th schedule and anti defection law when we come to implementing the 10th schedule or the provisions of 10th schedule right what are those problems we will be looking along with giving certain solution but why this article is important in gs paper 2 there is a topic parliament and state legislature functioning conduct of business also salient features of representation of people's act let's understand the importance of this whole topic with the help of previous year question in 2013 upsc asked this question directly about anti defection law right so you can expect this type of question in future as well what is the context there are lot of examples given by the author of this article which shows that still there is a defection practices right and this 10th schedule is not functioning properly how the political defection from one political party to other occurred in bihar 
during the election of Rajya Sabha, Himachal Pradesh witnessed cross voting and respective members of legislative assembly have been disqualified under the provisions of anti-defection law and in Andhra Pradesh assembly too, there have been disqualification under this law, right? There is also one argument put up by this article that there is a trade-off relationship between inner party democracy <laughs> and defection or anti-defection provisions. And if we want to improve the political democracy, if we want to improve the functioning of political parties and the political system, we have to reduce this trade-off and we have to think of a balanced approach between these two things, right? Firstly, what is political defection? So changing of party allegiance by elected legislature is termed as political defection. How? So, you are a leader, you nominated yourself from a, with the help of a political party for a particular election. You, you are getting elected and after getting elected, you are defying, either defying the order of the party's whip. What is whip? We'll be looking. But if you are defying the whip or you are splitting yourself from the political party or original part, political party to, to which you were associated, this is called political defection. This signifies the act of abandoning the party to which a legislature belong and on whose candidature they are elected to either the parliament of India or state legislature. Right? What is anti-defection law? We have seen under 10th schedule it has been defined after 52nd Constitutional Amendment Act 1985, right? Under this, under this anti-defection provision of 10th schedule, an elected legislature can be disqualified from the membership of the House on two basis, on the basis of two provisions. One is, if that legislator is voluntarily abandoning the membership of the political party, to which they originally belongs or voting against the direction of their party in the house that is called as whip order. So every political party is issuing whip order on a particular policy decision and every legislator has to abide by that whip order, right? If they are defying this also comes under the provision of anti-defection, right? But the 10th schedule has given, initially has given two exemptions to this defying of the party's decision or defection. One was splitting from the original political party and the merger. But this splitting provision was deleted in 2003 and there is only one exemption to this anti-defection or 10th schedule, which is merger. And that too, when two-thirds of the members of that party are splitting and merging with some other political parties, right? But there is an issue. How people are using loopholes, we can see here that Maharashtra Legislative Assembly Speaker delivered his verdict on the split within the Shiv Sena and Nationalist Congress Party. So there were two parties, NCP, Nationalist Congress Party and Shiv Sena. Some people, some legislature, legislator, they split it away from these their original parties and they, they claimed themselves as the original Shiv Sena and the NCP. Right? And now, state legislative assembly speaker, they, that uh, speaker is not disqualifying them because that speaker is considering this split as the legitimate split and which should not be come under 10th schedule. In these cases, the splitting faction did not opt to either merge within with an existing political party or 
establish an altogether new party. Instead, each of these two factions claimed to be original political party themselves and formed an alternate government with other political parties. In neither of these cases were was there a merger within the strict terms of 10th schedule, right? The speaker has termed these as intra-party dissent or inner party democracy and hence has adjudicated that they cannot be subjected to the punitive provisions of the 10th schedule, right? So, people, they have split it away from the original party. Now, they are claiming that they are the original one, right? And these anti-defection policies or provisions are now not implemented on those people, right? Moreover, the mergers mandatorily require a minimum of two-third members to separate from the political party, but this was not happening in this case, right? So, writer, the author of this article has given certain solution or way forward for these type of problems, right? He, she argued that if we apply 255th report of law commission, and if we try to ensure inner party democracy along with the 10th schedule or anti-defection law, this will be helpful in improving the political situation of India. How? So, apart from the constitution, constitution of political parties, this 255th report is suggesting to create an executive committee for the party system, right? So, for every party, there should be an executive committee which select the candidates who are to contest election to the parliament or state assembly and conduct a regular election within the party at every level. So, this was the recommendation given by 255th Law Commission and this was also supported by the author. Also, Law Commission also proposed granting the Election Commission of India the power to impose monetary penalties and to withdraw the registration of a political party in case it failed to comply with these provisions. So, through this, we can improve the political functioning of political parties. So, through this, we can improve the functioning of political parties and this was a perspective given by the article. Next article is National Dam Panel to Examine Kaleshwaram Project on March 6. This Kaleshwaram project is a lift irrigation project in the Kaleshwaram village of Telangana state. This project is on Godavari or confluence of Godavari and Pranhita river and multiple barrages have been created under this Kaleshwaram lift project or this lift irrigation project. One of the barrage, Medi Gadda barrage is sinking and which is creating a problem for the dam safety. Why this article is important for us? In the means, disaster and disaster management and prelims, Kaleshwaram lift irrigation project, right? Let's understand the importance of this question or this topic through a previous year question. 2023 UPSC asked this question, dam failures are always catastrophic, especially on the downstream side, resulting in a colossal loss of life and property and allies various causes of dam, dam failures, right? Also, in 2018, UPSC asked about the dam safety, right? So, this will be helpful in upcoming examination. You can expect questions from this, right? What is the context? National Dam Safety Authority. What is this National Dam Safety Authority? It's a statutory body created under Dam Safety Act of 2021 to oversee the dam safety in India. It's a regulatory body uh, which will implement the policy 
guidelines and standards for dam safety in india and which is working under the ministry of jal shakti right this ndsc has constituted a five member committee so ndsc is a statutory body which has created a committee to examine the kaleshwaram lift irrigation project more on news this is the kaleshwaram lift irrigation project first of all what is lift irrigation project irrigation you are providing water for agriculture but this irrigation is not being provided with the help of natural flow of the water instead you are lifting the water with the help of certain mechanical sources such as animals or uh, pumps right so with the help of these pumps these mechanical sources you are uplifting lifting the water and then you are providing this water to other areas which is in the demand of or demand for the water for irrigation right this formation of this committee comes in the response of the concerns raised by the telangana government regarding the sinking of the piers at the medi gadda barrage which is the largest barrage of the project right the government has requested ndsa to conduct a thorough examination of the structural hydraulic and geo technical aspects of these barrage this thing may not be important for police but you can use this data or information for your means or uh, substantiating means arguments right therefore the committee will engage with various stakeholders to and investigate on the causes behind the sinking of medi gadda barrage and any other observed distress alongside the recommending measures to mitigate these issues and prevent their recurrence in the future the committee has 4 months to submit its report to ndsa let's understand the kaleshwaram lift irrigation project from prelims point of view it's a multi purpose irrigation project in the kaleshwaram village in telangana the project it starts at the point where pranita or the confluence point of pranita river and the godavari river the vardha pen ganga and ven ganga rivers which together make up the seventh largest drain and basin on the subcontinent come together at the confluence of pranita river right so this is important information the project was originally called as pranita chevella project in the erstwhile andhra pradesh but after division of andhra pradesh it is named as kaleshwaram lift irrigation project right it's a world's largest multi stage and multi purpose lift irrigation project about godavari it's a second longest river in india after ganges it originates in trimbakeshwar maharashtra it is the east flowing river 1465 km this data is not important but second large longest river trimbakeshwar is important it is draining the states of maharashtra telangana andhra pradesh chatisgarh odisha and karnataka so these many states are being drained by this godavari river left bank tributary purna pranita indravati and sabri river and right bank tributaries are pravara manjira and manair right what about pranita it's the largest tributary of godavari river covering 34% of the drainage basin it is a confluence of smaller tributaries like vardha pen ganga and ven ganga river so before meeting to the godavari river it is being drained by the vardha pen ganga and ven ganga rivers what are the characteristic features of this project these data are not important for prelims or mains point of view but just to make you understand about the project or the importance of this project 
इट इज सप्लाइंग वाटर टू ऑलमोस्ट फोर्टी फाइव लाख एकर्स इन तेलंगाना एंड विल बी हेल्पफुल इन इरिगेशन एंड ड्रिंकिंग वाटर टू थर्टीन डिस्ट्रिक्ट ऑफ तेलंगाना द प्रोजेक्ट स्ट्रेचेस ओवर थ्री हंड्रेड किलोमीटर एंड रेज लार्ज वॉल्यूम ऑफ वाटर फ्रॉम द रिवर आफ्टर विच इट गेट्स रीडिस्ट्रीब्यूटेड इन चैनल बिफोर गेटिंग पंप टू द नेक्स्ट स्टेशन दिस पॉइंट इज इंपॉर्टेंट बिकॉज द प्रोजेक्ट दिस लिफ्ट इरीगेशन प्रोजेक्ट इज टू कॉम्प्लीमेंट एंड इनहेंस द एफर्ट्स ऑफ मिशन काका तिया एंड मिशन भागीरथा प्रोजेक्ट दीज टू प्रोजेक्ट ऑफ तेलंगाना गवर्नमेंट प्रोजेक्ट एंड लिफ्ट इरीगेशन दिस कालेश्वरम लिफ्ट इरीगेशन प्रोजेक्ट इज कॉम्प्लीमेंटिंग दीज टू प्रोजेक्ट टू सप्लाई वाटर फॉर ड्रिंकिंग एंड इरीगेशन पर्पजेस वट इज मिशन काका तिया इज अ फ्लैगशिप प्रोग्राम ऑफ तेलंगाना गवर्नमेंट टू रिज्यूवनेट और द फॉर द रिज्यूवनेशन ऑफ वाटर टैंक्स एंड अदर वाटर स्टोरेज स्ट्रक्चर्स विच विल बी हेल्पफुल फॉर स्मॉल एंड मार्जिनल फार्मर्स मिशन भागीरथा इज टू प्रोवाइड सेफ ड्रिंकिंग वाटर फॉर एवरी विलेज एंड सिटी हाउस होल्ड इन तेलंगाना राइट नेक्स्ट आर्टिकल इज वे आर क्लीन एयर फंड अलॉटेड टू स्टेट स्पेंड सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट इट डिवॉल्व सर्टेन फंड स्टेट गवर्नमेंट अंडर एन सी ए पी प्रोग्राम नेशनल क्लीन एयर प्रोग्राम वॉट इज एन सी ए पी प्रोग्राम विल बी लुकिंग इन लिटिल बिट लेटर ऑल ऑल्सो अंडर फिफ्टीन फाइनेंस कमीशन रिकमेंडेशन सो फंड वर डिवॉल्व टू स्टेट गवर्नमेंट फॉर क्लीन एयर इन अर्बन सिटीज अर्बन सेंटर्स राइट बट इट हैज बीन फाउंड आउट दैट दीज फंड वर नॉट यूटिलाइज फॉर इंटेंडेड पर्पजेज रादर डाइवर्टेड टू सम अदर पर्पजेज राइट and this has been discussed in this article why this is important in prelims general issues on environmental ecology in gs paper 3 means environmental pollution and degradation also from gs paper 4 there is a topic fund utilization and this whole example can be taken as case study for under utilization or misutilization of public funds right let's understand the importance of this whole topic with the help of previous year question 2015 upsc asked about three mega cities and the air pollution in mumbai delhi and kolkata right also in 2020 upsc directly asked this question about national clean air program so this article becomes important for us what is the context the funds were allocated under ncap national clean air program and the 15th finance commission between the financial year 2019-20 to 2023-2024 according to environment ministry submission in ngt national green tribunal last month 19 cities flagged by the tribunal for the deteriorating air quality they received 1644 crore in this period so in spite of the fact that they have got a lot of money a lot of funds for the clean air still these cities were flagged by ngt as poor air quality so let's understand the status of air quality in india first then we will be looking why there is an anomaly in the fund allocation and its utilization right so we know there is a high pollution level in indian cities and they the indian cities are frequently registering very high levels of air pollution for example delhi kanpur varanasi and patna there is a seasonal variations as well for example in delhi when there is a season for stubble burning in the neighboring states we see uh, delhi is experiencing severe pollution also during colder temperatures these pollutants are getting trapped in at the surface level so there is a seasonal variation as well how we collect data and how we monitor the air quality of our cities with the help of air quality index under ncap program there are six categories of air quality index or as per air quality index and we are categorizing our cities uh, with the help of this air quality index there are six categories one is satisfactory second is moderately polluted third is poor 
fourth is very poor fifth is severe and one more is good satisfactory good moderately polluted poor very poor and severe right there are eight pollutants on the basis of which we calculate the air quality or air quality index is being uh, used you can take an acronym to memorize the pollutants under aqi lap cons l for lead a for ammonia this nh3 p for pm 2 pm pm 2.5 pm 10 c for carbon monoxide it's not dioxide rather carbon monoxide o for ozone n for nitrogen oxides many various oxides are there and s for sulfur dioxide so to right so there are eight pollutants six categories good satisfactory moderately polluted poor very poor and severe this national air monitoring program it covers 240 cities in the country which is using aqi so what are the issues in the air pollution control measures in india there are basically four issues because of which we are witnessing air pollution or severe air pollution in indian cities as per this article first is the project selection funds are given to the states for improvement of air quality in the urban cities urban centers but these funds are not utilized for the air quality improvement rather these funds are diverted to some other projects such as construction of road so this is the first issue second issue there is a gross under utilization of the funds lack of capacity inadequate planning or bureaucratic hurdles are contributing to under utilization of funds there is also a problem of performance assessment source wise cause analysis for air pollution progress on action plans and quantification of air quality improvement is not under the performance assessment there is also lack of accountability this article is arguing or urging a need for environment ministry to ensure that assets created by spending funds are properly utilized right so let's take two topics two more topics for the prelims point of view under this article one is ngt and another is national clean air program ngt is a specialized judicial body it's also quasi judicial body right that was established in 2010 jurisdiction over all civil cases where a substantial question relating to the environment so this ngt national green tribunal is a tribunal quasi judicial body it will be looking on the matters pertaining to certain acts which are those acts first is water act water prevention and control of pollution act 1974 1977 air act air prevention and control of pollution act 1981 forest act 1980 environment environmental protection act 1986 the public liability insurance act 1991 and lastly biodiversity act 2002 the tribunal has same power as 
सिविल कोर्ट दिस इज अ फंक्शन ऑफ जुडिशियल क्वासी जुडिशियल बॉडी एंड द प्रिंसिपल ऑफ नेचुरल जस्टिस अप्लाई टू इट्स प्रोसीडिंग क्वासी जुडिशियल बॉडी और द फीचर्स ऑफ क्वासी जुडिशियल बॉडी वॉट अबाउट नेशनल क्लीन एयर प्रोग्राम द मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ इन्वायरमेंट फॉरेस्ट एंड क्लाइमेट चेंज एम ओ एफ एस सी इट लॉन्च द एन सी ए पी प्रोग्राम इन जनवरी ट्वेंटी नाइनटीन विद एन in 24 states uts by engaging all the stakeholders and this ncap program was aiming to reduce pm10 that is particulate matter 10 and particulate matter 2.5 levels by 20 to 30% taking 2017 as the base year by 24 compared to 27 level with a revised target aiming for a 40% reduction or achieving national ambient air quality standards by 2015 2025 2026 next article is gray zone warfare this term gray zone warfare becomes important for our prelims as well as mains because chief of defense staff recently has used this term under rai sina dialogue why this is important prelims as well as international relation and internal security point of view let's understand the context chief of defense staff in raisina dialogue he said in commentaries on china and taiwan he said gray zone warfare crops up in description of chinese actions around the island that it claims as its own so what is the definition of gray zone warfare so you are not directly involved in the direct confrontation or war with some other country right but you are using certain proxies to instabilize the other country so this is kind of gray zone warfare you are not directly involved but you are under certain kind of conflict with the other country and you are using certain other proxies to destabilize or to create instability in other country right so gray zone warfare represent activities that fall between outright war and peace you are not in peace with uh, each other and you are not directly uh, in direct conflict with other country characterized by ambiguity and indirect confrontation in international relation what are the characteristics range of activities like economic coercion for example usa sanctioned russia and iran so this was also gray zone warfare cyber attacks china usually do this cyber attacks disinformation campaigns and influence operation that are not outright warfare but are aggressive and coercive right historical context gray zone tactics have been used part of international relation for centuries but gained prominence during the cold war that we have studied in our world history books right what is the purpose purpose is to achieve certain strategic objectives to uh, create instability and to gain certain things right without engaging in open conflict for examples action by china in south Ch china sea and towards taiwan involving militarization intimidation and coercion are cited as example of gray zone warfare what could be the implication such action challenge that traditional military and diplomatic responses it requires nuanced and multidimensional strategies to address the underlying threats and ag aggressions right strategic aim of this gray zone warfare is to project power legitimate territorial claims or provoke adversaries into actions that can then be used to justify further escalatory responses globally international awareness or need for international awareness and strategies are required to address this non traditional security threats so for example china is also using gray zone warfare against india right so we have to understand the nature of this gray zone warfare and then we can give a proper reply or diplomatic reply against this non traditional security threats so far we have discussed all the important articles now let's do some practice questions 
फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज कंसिडर द फॉलोइंग स्टेटमेंट रिगार्डिंग एयर पॉल्यूशन कंट्रोल मेजर्स इन इंडिया The NCAP aims to reduce PM10 and PM2.5 levels by 20 to 30 percent by 2025, 2026, taking 27, 2017 as the base year. This part is correct, but this part is not correct. The 15th Finance Commission allocated funds in the name of Air Quality Grant to the cities to control the air pollution. This is correct. so option would be b part consider the following statements the godavari is the longest river in india and it empties into the arabian sea this is also incorrect it empties to bay of bengal and second longest river pranita river is the largest tributary of godavari that is formed by the confluence of vardha pen ganga and ven ganga rivers The Kaleshwaram lift irrigation project is located on the Godavari River. This is also correct. So two and three, C part would be correct answer. Next question is match the following dams: Tiri Dam, not Narmada, not Satluj, Bagirathi. So A four, A four, Bhakra Dam, Satluj, Hirakun Dam, Mahanadi. सरदार सरोवर डैम नर्मदा सो ए पार्ट विल बी द करेक्ट ऑप्शन कंसिडर द फॉलोइंग स्टेटमेंट्स रिगार्डिंग स्टेटस ऑफ वुमेन्स एम्प्लॉयमेंट इन इंडिया अर्बन अनएम्प्लॉयमेंट इज ग्रेटर देन रूरल अनएम्प्लॉयमेंट यस देर इज अ हायर परसेंटेज ऑफ अर्बन वुमेन हु हैव कंप्लीटेड हायर सेकेंडरी एजुकेशन सो वी हैव सीन दिस एनोमली येस बोथ आर करेक्ट सी पार्ट वुड बी द करेक्ट आंसर Fifth question is consider the following statements plastic overshoot day was initiated by india no swiss based organization india's recycling rate for plastic waste reached more than 80% last month no this is incorrect even government claims 60% but it's lesser than that so both are incorrect d would be the correct answer let's do mains practice question What do you understand by political defection? In the context of recent developments, critically examine the issue of inner party dissent or inner party democracy in the effective functioning of anti-defection law and suggest reform. It's advised that in such type of question, do not take name of any political party or any leader. Instead, use one political party another political party ruling party speaker etc right second thing first part of this question is asking about the political defection so you need to explain or you need to define the political def defection with the help of constitutional provisions that is 10th schedule right then in the body part you have to show how this political defection is in the trade off relationship with inner party democracy or dissent right and then you have to explain or examine the issues of inner party dissent that we have seen in the discussion and then you have to give solution as well because critically examine is the keyword here right so you have to give certain measures citing 255th report of law commission right so in introduction you have to define political defection write briefly about the anti defection law 10th schedule write briefly on the issue of inner party dissent how it is in the trade off relationship and which has emerged in the adjudication process of disqualification in maharashtra because the question is asking in the recent development then elaborate how it has put ten schedule in this use also in the conclusion mention the required reform measures specifically cite the 255th report of the law commission so this is how we conclude our discussion if you like our initiative please like share and subscribe thank you so much